if these events recorded in the Gospels record a period of time that later on in history, a church council comes together and confirms that, yes, these are the eyewitness accounts that we're going to include in Scripture. That is called the Council of Laodicea. It's 330 years after the actual events. A lot happens in 330 years. As a skeptic, I never believed these were written early by eyewitnesses. I believe they were written late in history by people who were creating a fiction. After all, if you write this after everyone who's alive who really knew the real Jesus is already dead, you can say anything you want about that Jesus because there's no one alive who could tell you you're a liar. If you're gonna lie about Jesus, you either have to do it out of the region or later in history. So I suspected it was over here somewhere. And by the way, I'm not the only one who feels that way. There are lots of skeptics who have written about Jesus, like Bart Ehrman, who's probably written more about Jesus than about anybody else I know. A graduate of Moody Bible Institute, Wheaton College, studying underneath Bruce Metzger, the famed uh, um, Bible scholar at Princeton. He's written all of these books, and he's an atheist. He's head of the Bible department at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He's teaching students Bible every day. And he's written lots of books that either claim that all of this stuff has been distorted, corrupted, it's written by, by frauds and forgers, and Jesus became God over the years because the story was distorted. He was a different Jesus before the Gospels were written because they are written late. If people like this are right, then we should stop calling this any kind of real history. It cannot be considered an eyewitness account if it was not written by people who were really there to see it. Now, of course, if we can date it somewhere over here or over here, the closer it gets to this point, the more reliable it becomes. It could still be a lie, but it's harder to lie early than it is to lie late. Does that make sense? I just needed to know, where would I put it on this timeline and on basis of what evidence? So I started to read through the Gospels to collect the evidence. There is a book in the New Testament written by Luke, in which he records everything that happened in the first century after Jesus ascended into heaven, and that is called the book of Acts. Does Luke ever mention in the book of Acts anywhere the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, which occurs around 70 AD? Does Luke ever mention that? Why wouldn't he mention that? I mean, remember, in Matthew, Jesus predicts this is going to happen wouldn't you want to show people that Jesus is an accurate predictor and actually record that it happened just the way that Jesus predicted? It's missing. Of all the things that have happened in the history of that area, this was the biggest. It'd be like doing a, a history of New York and leaving out the Twin Tower attack. They came in for years before and they surrounded the city and they blockaded it and starved the occupants. This is also missing from the book of Acts. And they starved them so desperately that the Jewish historian Josephus says that when they came in and knocked down the walls to finally sack the temple, they discovered the Jews were, some of them, one mother was so desperate that her son had died, she was starving, she was starting to eat her son. You don't think they would record that, that Luke wouldn't mention it, refer to it, even tangentially at all? Nope, it's missing. Why? At the end of the book of Acts, Paul is still alive in captivity. We know when he died, he was martyred in the same city that Luke says he was living in at the end of the book of Acts. Why wouldn't Luke just finish the story? Also, we know that Peter died around the same time. It's also missing from the book of Acts. James, the brother of Jesus, is martyred in Jerusalem in 61 AD. That is missing from the book of Acts. Yet, Luke writes about the death of James, the brother of John. That happened in 44. He mentions James, the brother of John's death, but he leaves out James, the brother of Jesus' death. Je that James was the leader of the largest Christian church on the planet in the city of Jerusalem, the leader of the first church council in Acts 15. Yet you don't mention how he died? You have no problem talking about deaths, right? There's two or three of them recorded in the book of Acts, but you don't mention these. The most important players are James, Peter, and Paul, yet you're silent about how they died. 
Hmm, why do you think none of this is mentioned in the book of Acts? Well, I think one reasonable inference is, is that it hasn't happened yet. If it hasn't happened yet, you can't mention it. So let's just test that theory. Let's tentatively date the book of Acts one year before the first missing event. Here it is. I could have put this 10 years before, but I'll put it one year before that event. That's why it's not mentioned. Now let's test it. Bible scholars, Luke wrote two books. This is not a trick question. What's the other book that Luke wrote? Luke. Which one did he write first? I don't know, do you? He wrote Luke first. And so we're gonna move over a date for Luke that's gonna have to be earlier than the date for Acts. And how do we know he wrote that first? Because he tells us that in the first verse of the book of Acts. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until he was taken up into heaven. So that's the first book, the gospel of Luke. Acts is everything that happened after that. They used to be together in one scroll, one papyrus called Luke Acts. Now, let's test this theory for a second. Paul writes a couple of key letters that'll help us test it. They provide more evidence. One of them is called 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 5, he tells Timothy, you should take care of your church leaders, like your pastors and your elders and your deacons, because they do a lot of work for you, and they deserve to be honored even financially. And I know that's true, Timothy, because my Bible tells me so. Really? Wouldn't you like to know what Paul is using as his Bible when talking to Timothy as early as 63 A.D.? He says, my Bible mentions, Scripture says, two things. Do not muzzle the ox while it's treading out the grain. That's from the Old Testament. That's Deuteronomy. And the worker deserves his wages. That's not from the Old Testament. That's from the New Testament. He's providing one Old Testament verse and one New Testament verse to make his case. He's quoting none other than Luke. And he's quoting Luke as early as 63 A.D., See it? So we know he's got Luke's gospel at 63, but I'm saying it's as early as 53 because there's another passage that Paul writes to the Corinthian church, a church that is a train wreck because they have got people in the church that are sleeping with their family members, getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. They're a mess. Stuff is discussed in Corinth that is not discussed in any other letter. Speaking in tongues, what letters mention that? Corinthian letters, that's it. This stuff is happening in Corinth. It's not happening anywhere else. And he writes to them, he says, hey, I taught you better. Do not be getting drunk before the Lord's Supper. I taught you how to do the Lord's Supper. And he recites back to them a passage of scripture to remind them of what he had taught them earlier. Now, he had been in Corinth around 51. And he is now writing a few years later, 1 Corinthians, to say, hey, knock it off. I taught you better. And he quotes them. He says, Jesus said that you should do this the Lord's Supper, a particular way. This is my body, which has been given up for you. Do this in remembrance of me. What is he quoting there? He's quoting the gospel of Luke, a little, even larger section of the gospel of Luke, to the church in Corinth. There is no other version of the Lord's Supper by any other gospel author in which Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. It's not in John, it's not in Mark, it's not in Matthew, it's only in Luke. He's quoting Luke here. And he's quoting it early. To a church, he's telling, I taught you this even earlier. Go back to what I taught you. So how early is he teaching this? How early is Luke's gospel? I think we're okay in saying it's somewhere in the 50s. And here's a little piece of, I think, interesting. Uh, if, you, if you do word studies, it's called forensic statement analysis when you do uh, work with bad guys. What we basically do is we tell bad guys, hey, um, yesterday was the day of the crime. Do me a favor on this piece of paper, one side, you have 24 lines. I want you to take this pen and I want you to write everything you did yesterday from the time you got up in the morning to the time you went to bed. You can't make any corrections and erase. You can change it with your pen, but you can't turn the page over. So you only got 24 lines to do it. Then we look at this 24 line recital of yesterday's activity and we look for uh, uh, deception indicators, compression of time, expansion of time, use of pronouns. We can learn a lot. I can tell you whether he's our guy after reading that statement. I can also probably tell you what time of day he killed him, how he compresses time. Something similar happens in scripture. I'm looking a lot at words that are not necessary 
Because the words you don't have to use but choose to use give you away. They're almost always, always adjectives and adverbs. This is my clicker. This is my really super powerful 100 foot yard range, 100 yard range, cool black plastic clipper. I added a clicker. I added a lot of adjectives to that. Didn't have to. I chose to. It might tell you something about me. Why would I say all that? Luke does the same thing in this passage in Luke 1. He's writing to the person he mentions later, Theophilus. Here's what he says. I want you to look for the adjectives and adverbs that are not adverbs that are not necessary. These stuck out for me. Remember, word usage is a big giveaway. Let me give you another way. You met my wife, Susie. She's here with me someplace. If I introduced her to you and I said, or I talked about my wife and I said, um, you asked me, what did you do last night for dinner? Oh, I took my wife, Susie, to dinner. I could have said, I took my beautiful wife, Susie, been together for 37 years, took her to dinner. I would have told you a lot about her, didn't have to. I could have said, I took my wife to dinner, left out her name, left out any descriptors, if I've given you a 3,000 word statement or a 30,000 word statement, and I've described all my friends with their first names and descriptors, but then when I get to my wife, I leave out a first name and descriptors, it might be telling you something. Maybe it's not, we'll see. What did you do last night? Took the wife to dinner. Oh, not even a possessive pronoun, not my wife. I took the wife. <laughs> Have you ever heard one say that? Why would you do that? If you're using possessive pronouns with all of your friends and you're using an objectifying pronoun with your wife, mm, I got a problem with that. What'd you do last night? Took the old lady to dinner. <laughs> do you see the gamut? Okay, now let's go to Luke. Here's a sentence he uses. He says, therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you've been taught. There are three additional words you don't need that he chose to use. Here's one. I have carefully, could he just said I've investigated this? No, he carefully, if you read Luke, Luke's history is pretty meticulous. His account is very careful. Here's another one. Most excellent. Don't need to use that expression. Why am I using it? Well, we think that that's usually a title given city leaders. Maybe Theophilus is a leader in the city. We don't know. But he doesn't have to call him this way. As a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, he doesn't use that title. He's already introduced him once at the beginning of the text. He doesn't use it again the second time. It's something to think about. Here's one that got me, though. An orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. That word in the Greek means correct chronological order. Duh. Like, you need to tell me, I'm writing a history of Jesus, an account of Jesus, and I've got it in the right order. Like, <laughs> isn't history supposed to be in the right order? Like, you need to tell me that? Why would you need to tell me that your account is in the correct chronological order? Unless, of course, there's another first century account out there that's even earlier than mine, but it's not in the correct chronological order. Oh, really? What would that be? It turns out there's a bishop named Papias in the first century that says that Mark's account is written at the feet of Peter in Rome. And Papias says that Mark's account is correct, but not necessarily orderly. He uses the same Greek word. Hmm. So he's got Mark's stuff. And that's what he says here. He's not an eyewitness. Luke's not an eyewitness. Luke is actually interviewing the first eyewitnesses, one of which is Mark, and he's asking. He's asking questions. And now he's got it all in the correct order. And who do you think he quotes more than any other source word for word? Mark. But now he's got Mark's stuff in the right order. Now this makes sense. But that means that Mark's stuff's even available earlier. Now, if I'm wrong by 10 years here, it's still too early. If I'm wrong by 15 years, still too early. If I'm wrong by 35 years and there's not a biblical scholar out there that'll say I'm, I'm that wrong, it's still too early. Really? Like, you think you can remember things 35 years later? Yeah, you can. No, you can't. Yes, you can. Not all memories are created equal. They're not. Men, we're coming up on Valentine's Day. Men, just in your mind, think about this. What did you do last year for your wife for Valentine's Day? I don't remember what I did. I did something nice, I'm sure. 
What'd you do three years ago for your wife for Valentine's Day? I don't know. I've had 37 Valentine's Days. I don't remember them. Sorry. But if you ask me what I did on Valentine's Day in 1988, I can tell you hour for hour what I did because that's the day I married Susie. Not all memories are created equal. You could be out fishing and hunting every day. One day is just like another. If I ask you, what was your fishing like three, days, uh, three years ago today? You would go, I don't know. But if you're out fishing one day and a dude walks up to you on the water, you're gonna remember that day. <laughs> Not all fishing days are created equal. Yeah. Are we clear? And we do this all the time in criminal trials. Defense attorneys always want to say disparaging things about memory, but not every memory is created equal. 